Hello and welcome to CD Oasis. My name is Shiraz Gisayer. We continue our series on implant placement and restoration with Dr. Paul Benziki, and this is episode two. For those of you who may not know Dr. Benziki, he is a general dentist from Toronto with four decades of clinical experience that he shares with his colleagues. So after I welcomed Dr. Belziki to CD Oasis, I asked him about the main themes of this episode or this presentation, and here's what he said. However, before we go and watch the case, I hope you enjoyed the episode, the series, and please let us know what you think and tell other people about us on social media. So until next time, bye-bye for now. So this is a continuation in the series on implants, and um, it's just some interesting cases, how I've handled them, and hopefully that the viewer, if they bump into something similar, has some insight on how to treat a case that might be similar, that might have similar attributes. No two cases are the same, but seeing a number of them, how other clinicians have handled them, is often beneficial to coming up with a treatment plan on your own. So this time around, we're, we're focusing on, on two characteristics of this case. The first one is the fact that uh, the case is actually your dental lab technician yeah. uh, with whom you have a great, long, lifelong yes. relationship. So it's personal. Yes. And being a general practitioner, uh, part of retaining patients over the course of decades is is providing that personal touch. And it's not a byline and it's not a business plan or anything like that. It's just, I try to treat people how I would like to be treated. If, and, and that to me has been, has proven successful in patients coming to me for, for, for most of their life and when they move away, they go to another dental office. I get phone calls a year later, Paul, we got to come back. They're just not you. Working on a lab technician that I had a relationship with for 25 years. Well, you want to do the best you can. I want to do the best I can for everybody. But when it's somebody that's close to you, uh, it's very, very satisfying and gratifying. But you know you're dealing with a lab technician. He knows as much as you do and more in his field of technology and trying to make these things as perfect as possible. It's challenging. It, it, and it's, it's wonderfully challenging. And the second uh, focus of the presentation is you talking about the importance of the, the human touch, even though you do use and rely on technology. And it's not that you don't like technology and advances in dentistry. It's just that your part is equally important as the technological product that is brought to you. Can you speak a little bit about that also? I've said in the past, I have fashioned every provisional I've put in. Whether it's a single crown or it's a roundhouse, I've fashioned everything. In doing so, I know what will work in the mouth in terms of occlusion, in terms of functionality, in terms of biocompatibility, embrasure spaces, where it should be open, where it should be closed. That takes a lot of skill, and that takes a lot of trial and error. And I just uh, have found, it's been my experience, when I get something back from a lab, whether it's made by hand or it's made by computer, I always have to tweak these things. Because in the final analysis, I'm the dentist. I'm the one that's providing it. And I've just learned what works and what works well. And making sure that all of those components, making sure that, that, that the anatomy, the configuration of metal and porcelain is harmonious with the patient. If you don't struggle with that, if you don't do the trial and error and you've never struggled with it, well, then you put up your hands and you say, I don't know. So whatever my lab technician gives me, 
or whatever computer gives me, I guess they know because I don't. So I trust them. Well, I don't trust anybody. And I said, I said, I don't even trust me. I know that if I'm not looking, if, if I'm lackadaisical and don't pay attention, little things that I've missed come back to haunt me. So my lab technician tells me that it's getting harder and harder for him to find good lab techs because the kids coming out of school, they want to work on a computer. They don't want to work with wax. They don't want to work with a Bunsen burner. They don't, they don't, want, to, they don't want to do the hands-on artistic process that you have to go through. Well, if you don't do it with your hands, how are you going to transfer that knowledge of what you need to a computer screen, which isn't a person, which isn't a live entity? And I think that you have to know what the optimum is to know when you should reject it, when you should say, no, this isn't right. And a lot of times uh, when we do do uh, computer milled, computer generated, if you will, appliances, I want to see that design before they mill it because invariably I like to tweak it. So I've learned sometimes we do this over a distance where I, I can manipulate the lines or the shape on the computer screen and say, no, I don't want it that wide. I want it this way because lab guys buy into what dentists tell them. Dark triangles, dark triangles. You know, we don't, we don't want to have dark triangles. Close the embrasure, close the embrasure. Well, yeah, you've closed the embrasure. You don't have dark triangles, but now you get red puffy skin within a week or two because the patient can't get in there. It's choking off the tissue. So all of those fine things, lab technicians don't have an eye for that nor should they because that we have to dictate that and that's my it's not a beef but that's just my caveat on anything new and improved or old i mean you can have old technology and and it can be artistically gorgeous or you can have it just garbage it's knowing however it's coming to you you have to be you have to supply the final judgment is this good or is this not good and if you're not doing it on your own with your hands where are you going to learn that how's that going to come to you it's like anything else anything anything um and and i've lived through all of the this is new and improved i've lived through this is a game changer and invariably they worked yeah, some of the mill processes, I mean, it's, it's great what they're doing, and they're improving all the time. But even if they can get it perfect, there's things have to be tweaked, and every dentist has a style or a conception of what is perfect. And I want them to replicate my vision of what's perfect, not some generalized average algorithm that, well, a lot of dentists like it like this, so we're going to just make it like this. No, no, you make it how I want it. When you can make it how I want it, then I'll buy into it. So welcome back, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed the first presentation on implants, and this is just a follow-up. And it's basically uh, not a didactic, this is how you do it. This is more of, this is how I do it. I want to try to show some interesting cases that are a little bit different, uh, not that you encounter every day, because that's just been my, my experience. Nothing comes to my office that's textbook. Like everything is always a little odd. And if you can get some insight, if you bump into something that's self-similar, if it tweaks something to help you out in a case, then that's that I feel is my, my role in this. It's my role isn't to take you by the hand and teach you how to do implants. So as again, just to review what I tried to stress at the last presentation is that implant cases are a collaboration between colleagues. And this is true if you're not placing the implants. <clears throat> if you're doing the whole thing, then that's even more wonderful. But if you have to rely on colleagues to place the implants or other colleagues to do the imaging, there has to be good collaboration and communication between everybody. 
So as I always mention, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a general practitioner, and I typically have provided periodontal surgery, endodontics, restorative dentistry, and that includes implants. And my goal is to integrate all of the protocols, all of the skills I have to deliver long-lasting restorations in terms of decades. And after 40 years, I can tell you for sometimes it's been for life. So I don't place implants and this forces me to work with trusted colleagues. And that's always been difficult because it's difficult for me to give trust. You have to prove that you're worthy of it. And that goes two ways. I, I want to work with people and I, I don't expect them to put more into a case than I'm not willing to put forward. And trust must be earned both ways. And I also said when multiple players are involved, if it's a team effort, who's the quarterback? Somebody has to be the quarterback. And it's always been my opinion that it's the restorative dentist. It's me because I'm the last person that touches or inserts the restoration. And if there's going to be a problem, they come back and they blame me. So if there is an issue, I don't want to have anybody else to blame to say, oh, the surgeon didn't put it there, it didn't put it properly, the bone was at the wrong angle, we didn't know. Those are bad excuses. So everything has to be planned out. And I reviewed a case quickly, or I'll try to review it quickly here, and that's conceiving and sharing a vision that has to be shared with the patient, colleagues that you're working with, the lab, and implant companies, because they are often a good source of knowledge as well. So you have to work it all out before a patient is touched. You have to know with a good degree of certainty what are all the steps involved to get over the goal line. So in this case, we were converting from an RPD to some implant support crowns, which were splinted. And the plan is always to provide restorations that are biocompatible and harmonious with the surrounding structures, and they have to be cleansable. It's very important by both us and the patient because if embrasures are too tight and the patient can't get cleaning instruments in between their teeth, go-betweens or whatever they may end up using at home, if they can't clean, it's, it's, it's going to fail. So success is no accident. You don't back into it at the end of a case and say, oh, whoop de doo look what I did. It, it, it turned out perfectly. You have to plan for it ahead of time. And I went on to show some techniques and how I developed those uh, from conventional crown and bridge. And I showed here how has old school held up. And this was a case that has survived some 27 years. Just doing it, uh, it not really involving high tech in this case because at that time it wasn't there to begin with. But over the course of 27 years, we've got these four implants in the lower arch and everything continues to hold up. Now the person that did the crown and bridge for that case is my good, my good friend, uh, Gabriel Pintos, who's a lab technician here in Toronto. He's retired now. But when I started, we worked for 25 years. I could cut down an entire arch, not give him one piece of paper. I could just say, Gabriel, make bridge. And we knew what each of us needed to bring a case to a successful conclusion. Uh, we worked that closely. And in his terms, we're, we're brothers. And when I'm working with somebody, I like them to like me. I figure if I got to give my money to somebody, I might as well give it to somebody I like. So Gabriel showed up in 1983. He's originally from South America. Uh, Hardworking man. And he said, my, my teeth are falling apart. So I said, okay, let's fix them up. So this is his case. This is going to Gabriel's mouth. This was done back in 1983. This is off of ectochrome slides. This is before digital, radio, uh, digital photography. So the case was cemented in. I don't have a ton of pictures because we just didn't take them back then. And it, it were, was on teeth that uh, some of them were endodontically treated, had cast post cores. So we strapped up most of the upper arch did an upper reconstruction, also fixed up the lower teeth as well at the time. And that was back in 1983. And this is the old story of the shoemaker who never had time to make shoes for himself. So we did this, 
And I said, Gabe, you have to show up for routine cleanings. I talk to him every day. We send cases back and forth. His office was about 300 yards from my office. But he just never showed up for routine cleanings. And that case lasted some 20 years. And I must, we must have cleaned his teeth maybe twice in that span of time. And things started to fail after 20 years. There was some decay. So what we did was, and again, I didn't have a camera at that time, so I, I can't show you all of this. But what we did was we kept some of the teeth that were, that were still in good shape. And we decided to put gold copings on each one of those teeth because Gabriel did not want to have a full upper denture. But he said, look, you just get me to the point where I'll make some sort of overdenture or, an over, or some sort of bridge that will sit on top of these gold copings. They won't be cemented in. They'll just sit on them. And, and let, me, let me get back to the lab because I'm busy. I'll make it, and, uh, and you'll have a look at it. So it was wonderful because I really never saw this or how it was made. Gabriel, being a, lab, a wonderful lab technician, concocted this all on his own. And it's... Uh, methyl methacrylate, denture colored, or tooth colored denture acrylic that he fashioned to sit on those five gold copings that were on teeth. And he lived with this for, I, I would say about 10 years. He maintained this all on his own. I never saw it. It broke. It, it was wonderful because it was his responsibility. And thankfully, I didn't have to contend with it. And we would go out for dinners and Christmas dinners, and he could eat, he could do whatever he wanted to do, and everything was fine and dandy. And then he presented in 2009, and he had pain in the upper right cuspid. So here you can see um, in what the cases looked like, and things looked pretty decent. There was no recurrent decay, but there was a bony angular defect, which is usually indicative of a cracked tooth. And that's indeed what happened. So I had to extract that tooth. And we'd often talked over the years, we should do an implant case, we should do an implant case, because it was thought between the two of us that this provisional appliance that he had fashioned on his own would kind of be the, the, um, the stopgap or we could use this converting uh, from an overdenture on teeth to something on implants. But of course, we're busy during the day and it just never happened and often symptoms drive treatment. So the desire for an implant supported case, and I missed the T there, and we need to assure long-term survivability given the less than ideal maintenance history and his occlusion. And he kind of looked like Freddie Mercury. He was very much class two, where prominent uh, maxilla and kind of a smaller lower jaw. And it was difficult to find, to find a bite. It's almost as if the lower teeth are just enveloped by the upper teeth. And he did not want to wear a full denture at any time. So... In his words, I have no bite. This is going to be difficult. And this is due to the class two configuration I've mentioned. So I used his provisional appliance that he came in with just to get a ballpark mounting. So I took an impression of the copings and put his denture or this, uh, this appliance in place, mounted it, and I at least had a starting point. So the plan was to place four implants to secure a bar that would retain a removable denture with locator snaps. So four implants were placed, and due to the anatomy of the bone, you can see several of the two, the two front ones are, are, splayed, are splayed anteriorly. They're all going off at a different direction. And what was done, the other cusp was removed. So essentially the three teeth, the two molars, and this one central, was used to support that 
uh, upper appliance that he had made. And this was the day of impression taking. And we ex extracted the remaining molar right after the impressions were taken. And then inserted back the healing caps. And the wonderful thing about methyl methacrylate acrylic, which I'm always harping on, is that you can add to it an indefinite number of times. So what I did was, after the caps were placed, I just relined the undersurface. So it would hang on to the two molars and then sit on top of the healing caps. And that provided some good stability, waiting to transition into the final prosthesis once we got everything back. So we reconfigured it and we were able to keep him out of a full upper denture the entire time. Now we talk about high tech and part of this presentation deals with that. Um, but even, so we're having a bar that's going to be milled by Nopal BioCare and CAD CAM. And even though I thought I gave them a wonderful impression, they said, we require a verification jig in order to orient the implants to one another as they exist intraorally in the mouth. We want something that we can we're, be comfortable with that we're going through this process of milling it. We want to make sure that we've got as accurate a representation of what's there as possible. So my lab technician, uh, Dennis DeMarkey, fashioned this and it's, it, there are, there are, metal cylinders that go into each implant and then hung off the metal cylinder is just a skeleton of acrylic and there's gaps open here and this just harkens back to the old school te the technique of solder indexing intraoral solder indexing with and I do this every day so I'm very comfortable with this procedure and this is the case I showed at the first presentation where merely just flowing some acrylic methyl methacrylate in between the solder joints, it hardens, you remove it, and now each coping is related to each other as they sit in the mouth on the tooth. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the most accurate representation I can get. So again, just flowing some methyl methacrylate. I could have used the, the red pattern resin, but I've got tons of this stuff, so I just use that all day long. And now they're all attached, so each implant can be related to each other as it sits in the mouth. And it did go back on the original stone model that uh, we had made, the, the original master model. So there you have it. Now once I had this, I thought, boy, this is neat, because I can pick up a whole lot of other parameters with this as well. So here is the jigged up uh, matrix in his mouth. I still have tons of pink wax in the office and Bunsen burners and I deal with hot wax all day. So I was able to just put some wax in this area, start marking midlines, get a smile line, trying to guesstimate where those teeth should end up. So it was a neat way of mounting the case and getting some other landmarks as to where we would like to be with the prosthetic teeth and mounted the case in the office here. I, I like doing lab work. We got back before milling the case, we got back a, well, the hybrid denture, just as a mock-up, some acrylic with some wax. And we tried this in because what Noble BioCare wants to do is marry the image of what you want to put on this bar so they can try to configure the bar where uh, they think everything will line up nicely. So that was put in and this is just some of the images and this was done some 10 years ago. So I don't know if they have the software anymore but this is just some of the images from Mobile BioCare. And as you go through you can see here in this box right here, um, they're, they're able to figure out where, where the tooth is and where the underlying 
components will be. And that goes over several of the, or over all of the framework. So the computer's trying to do its thing to give me something that will just pop into the mouth. And that's always the claim. Just give us an impression, give us the snap, a model off, and don't worry, we'll take care of it. So we got this back from Nobel BioCare, and that's the model that was uh, a result of that verification jig. And it did go back on the master model quite nicely. And I looked at this and I thought, so this is what they designed. These areas look a little, oh, and there's the overdenture snaps. And I just thought, boy, this looks like it's sticking out into space. How is that going to impact the position of those teeth? This is the day of trying, and I must say, it just fit absolutely beautifully. This, I think, was my first extensive wraparound prosthesis that was done uh, as it was milled CAD CAM. And I was blown away that that arch and everything just fit spot on. And I thought, I'm going to have a problem with this. That flange is going to be so <laughs> too buckle, it'll it'll puff his lip up quite a bit. So we had to do further refinement. So here is the marriage of your high tech, but it still requires clinical skill, clinical experience, and some degree of artistry and an image in your mind of where you want the teeth to be. You just can't accept what comes back from either a lab or Noble BioCare or any of the, of the other manufacturers. You, you have to play with these things. So I ended up taking a green stone or some milling device, some drill with my electric handpiece, and just started trimming this down, trying to get it as flush as I could with the, with the ridge. And the final overdenture was made on that without a pallet. And it fit very, very nicely. Um, it was so secure that initially we only used three locators because it was hard to get off with five. And by doing those refinements, I was able to bring the flange in and the entire complex of metal and plastic over these areas is just shy of three millimeters. So that his lip, not, the whole thing isn't puffed and bumped out, which was a concern. This was the day of insertion, 2013. I had to give him some local, that's why it's bleeding a little bit, those are the puncture wounds. And the tissue was quite, quite nicely healed. Uh, the bar was tricky to get in. You couldn't put the, the four of them in all at once. You had to insert the two going backwards into the anterior implants, and once they touched, you could then swing the lower or the, the posterior implants into place. And you can see the angulation here that forces you, because if you try to put it in here first, it would just bump up against the skin. So you have to put the anterior implant, the anterior segment in first and then kind of rotate it back onto the posterior implants. And there it is. And I thought, hey, I'm pretty good. Wow. This, this looked this look fabulous. I gave the mirror to Gabriel, and it wasn't a midlife crisis. It was a midline crisis. And he said, my midlines are off. My facial midline and the midlines of these teeth. And I said, I, well, maybe a little bit, but geez, look at everything that we've done. And now you're complaining about the midline? Sometimes when we would discuss some of these big cases where a patient wanted just something tiny changed on a big case, which would require remaking a lot of it, he would say, it's as if somebody came in with no legs, you gave them legs, you taught them to walk, they could sprint, and now they're complaining of the color of the shoes you gave them. Well, he fell into that category. He didn't like where the midline was. 
So he was a retired technician, but he still had skills. So I said, I tell you what, Gabe, here's the prosthesis. Here are the models. Why don't you go to the lab between you and my technician that I currently have, Dennis, go to his lab between the two. You play with this hours on end. When you're happy, return to my office and, and we'll do the final insertion. And that's exactly what happened. So it came back and he was thrilled. And this is the recall some three or four years later. He was in a few weeks ago, looks exactly the same. Right now, tissue is, is wonderfully healthy. So this design allows for a robust bar to resist the forces of occlusion by distributing those forces over several implants. I think that's important. And the locators do provide adequate denture retention. It's never been a problem. And him being a technician, I just give him a supply of locators and he can pop them in and out on his own. And the removable superstructure also it's a stress breaker. It provides additional dissipation of stress, which is beneficial for the long-term prognosis and survivability of those implants. And components, things can be easily fixed if the teeth wear out or whatever. It's, it's not a nightmare to, to repair. And it greatly facilitates home care. He can pop it out, clean in and around everything. And his gums have never looked so good. So I'd like to just say a few words about man versus machine and new technologies. And I'd like to do that with uh, an example of the Hubble Space Telescope that was sent up in 1992, for those of you too young to remember. It was supposed to be space stationed and get beautiful images such as this, where light didn't have to come through the upper atmosphere of the planet. Instead, they got smudges, smudgy pictures such as this. And this was much to the embarrassment and the disappointment of NASA, as well as the United States as a whole. They were the laughing stock. NASA was the laughing stock and all the media. And it came down quickly. They realized that it was improper grinding of the main mirror that led to a problem called sphere, collaborate, uh, sphere collaboration. And this was a result after um, they tried to figure out what went wrong and it came down to a blind faith in technology. So this is a cross section of the Hubble Space Telescope and at the heart of it is, is a main mirror. And that mirror must be ground to near perfect curvature within a tolerance of 10 nanometers, which is a fraction of the wavelength of visible light. So light comes from a distant object, from a star or a galaxy, hits the main mirror, is reflected back to a secondary mirror, and then it goes through a hole in the main mirror and hits the photoreceptors, and then analyzed. And here is the slab on which that mirror, from which that mirror is ground. And it's about eight feet in diameter and weighs over 800 kilograms. And they're supposed to grind it to that shape which they did. Now the story goes that the company that was contracted by NASA and the government was Perkin Elmer. And their, their claim to fame was they were going to use a new computer controlled grinding and analyzing system to get this eight foot slab of glass into the perfect dimensions. NASA, they, NASA was a little bit worried and they said, look, let's, let's go with two backup mirrors one to be ground by Kodak, one by iTech, and they were to use the traditional methods. After everything was done or during uh, the processing, the Perkin-Elmer mirror was tested by NASA by their scientists and technologists, and they, and they were using traditional methods, and they identified the flaw. They identified that the mirror was, a, was just a hair too flat. The Perkin-Elmer new computer controlled method sh did not show the flaw. It failed to pick up the flaw. So an argument ensued between Perkin-Elmer's and NASA the scientists and the engineers of Perkin-Elmer said, listen, we're using new high-tech systems and they're superior to what you had done. So eventually Perkin-Elmer went out, went out and the mirror was sent up and it was flawed. The two mirrors fabricated by the traditional means were perfect. So what's, what was the reason for this? 
Well, the analyzing device, the new analyzing device, was improperly assembled. It was some little washer somewhere was flipped one way rather than another, and it was a fraction, a fraction of a uh, of a millimeter off, and that led to the claim that the mirror was correct. So the sales pitch, the sales pitch from all of these companies, including the dental companies, is high tech. It's the way to go. And the pitch is, trust me, trust me, everything will be okay. And often my compact line is, listen, I don't trust me. How can I trust you? I know I'm fallible. I know I can make a mistake. And I'm sure you can too. So this was the design that came back from Noble BioCare. Yes, it was, it's beautifully milled. It fit wonderfully. But there were problems with it, small problems with it that I, a human, had to pick up. So man versus machine. Yes, we do need to use new technology. They're here to stay. But we have to know what does the technology give us and what are the shortcomings? Every system has some shortcoming that I know I, ov I often have to bump into on my own and find a workaround. So after 40 years, I say quite unabashedly, I consider myself a master artisan. And I'm not boasting. Um, I spend 40 years, I've spent 40 years at my office and my days are long. And we're told by... I Gladwell, I think, made this comment. It takes 10,000 hours of effort to master any given task. Well, I tell you that if you consider a 40 hour week and you take a certain amount of weeks off for vacation, this amounts to some four or five years. I've got eight times that amount. So I, together with my trusted colleagues, my surgeons and my lab technicians, we create functional art. That's what we do. And I'm often fond of saying, I'm a skilled human milling machine, and I'm guided by a human mind. I grind shapes, uh, dimensions, whether they're a prosthesis or teeth, and I do this in real time, analyzing as I go along. What is the intent of what I'm trying to do? And that guides my hands, and it guides what shape I come up with. A computer doesn't do that. It's just merely an obedient tool. And as they say, garbage in and garbage out. That little washer for that mirror on Hubble, it was just flipped the wrong way and everything was off. So a machine does not possess the intellect nor the intentionality of an artisan. And that's what I think I am. So when I ground this metal substructure, I did it with a vision of what was to go on top of that structure. So we have to direct machinery to give us what we want. It's just a neat tool, but it still has to be directed by somebody knowledgeable. And if you haven't done this on your own, if you don't grind your temps, if you don't struggle with this, how do you know? How are you going to learn? And it remains my struggle to fight for every detail. And that, my friends, is doing it old school. Thank you for your attention.